Revelation 14. Then I looked, and there was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven, like the sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder. The sound I heard was like harpists playing on their harps. They sang a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders. But no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women since they remained virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were redeemed from humanity as the first fruits for God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying high overhead with the eternal gospel to announce to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation, tribe, language and people. He spoke with a loud voice. Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another, a second angel followed, saying, It's fallen. Babylon the great has fallen. She made all the nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. And another, a third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead, Or on his hand, he'll also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He'll be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for endurance from the saints who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they'll rest from their labours since their works follow them. Then I looked and there was a white cloud and one like the Son of Man was seated on the cloud with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple crying out in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap. For the time to reap has come since the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Then another angel who also had a sharp sickle came out of the temple in heaven. Yet another angel who had authority over fire came from the altar and he called out in a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the vineyard of the earth because its grapes have ripened. So the angel swung his sickle at the earth and gathered the grapes from the vineyard of the earth and he threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Then the press was trampled outside the city and blood flowed out of the press up to the horses' bridles for about 180 miles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, On February 28, 1888, a soccer match took place in Scotland. Uh, It reveals much about Scottish identity and culture. Uh, On that day, Celtics and Rangers played their first match. No one on that day grasped the significance of that match. Uh, A little less than 100 years later, the same two teams played in the Scottish Cup final. Celtic triumphed over Rangers, and then in a full televised public show, there was a massive riot in the middle of the pitch as both groups of fans ran on and people were sent to hospital. Everyone finally saw the depth of the Great Division because if you're in Scotland, you're either Celtics or Rangers. There's no one in between. In fact, that Great Division between those two clubs then revealed a deeper division, a division that was sectarian and religious, a division that played out in streets and pubs, a division that limited where you would walk in Edinburgh. A great division led to great violence, conflict and bloodshed and it revealed something really, really deep within that society. And that division swung backwards and forwards depending on who won the premiership that year. Great division, great conflict, 
deep roots. Uh, Dan exposed a bit of that, didn't he, in the kids' talk? Uh, On some levels, they're serious divisions. On other levels, they're laughable. We all know Kia is best, and it happens across the whole world history. It happens across all of world history, that great division, that great conflict, and the violence that goes with it. Many in our world think it swings backwards and forwards, don't they? But in today's passage, on the grandest scale, the scale of the whole cosmos, we're shown the great division, the great conflict, and the one certain outcome. Jesus wins, and there is no doubt. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that we can read it. Thank you that it's vibrant. Thank you that it's living. Thank you that it is the revelation of your nature to people like us so that we can have great clarity, great humility, great grace, and great certainty in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, God's written, I'm at point two on the outline, God's written a clarifying word about the faithful witness, Jesus, written by a faithful witness, John, so that God's mob might be a faithful witness, which is to proclaim and practice Jesus in the whole world. Look at Jesus. He lived, died, and rose for our sins, and he's coming back soon to restore all creation. John received this while sitting on a rock in the middle of the Mediterranean, Patmos. He was there because he was a faithful witness. John is not writing about things that are foreign to him. He is living this at the moment he writes. Uh, And as he receives God's word, he is shown what was. Remember Revelation 2 and 3? A confronting and comforting word from God to his people. Uh, John is shown what is as he's taken up into the throne room of heaven. Remember the cosmic cutaway? As he's taken in Revelation 4 and 5 to God on the throne, the slaughtered lamb walking into the throne room and taking that scroll worthy to open the plan of God to bring his promises to their culmination, to restore the world. And as the scroll is unsealed, remember the seven seals, John is shown what will be, what is, what what was, what is, what will be, and that's where we are now in Revelation 6 to 17. All given so God's people can be a faithful witness to Jesus. Uh, In the section we're in, Revelation 6 to 17, we have cycles of, can anyone remember the the number? Four cycles of seven. And remember, they go again and again and again. We've looked at seven seals. We've looked at seven trumpets. We've got seven signs today and then seven bowls next week. Remember, they're not consecutive events. So you can work out a timeline of history. They're concurrent events, the same period of time looked at from different angles. And we get a deeper and deeper insight. As each layer is laid on the one before, we have a deeper insight of what will be. For example, the seven seals describe the plan of God and it begins with the dealing with sin. When we get to the seven trumpets, we see that that deeper sin that God's dealing with is idolatry. Remember turning good things into God things? And now we see in these seven signs, even deeper, the great division and conflict that lies underneath. A division and conflict that bubbles up in individuals and whole human enterprises. As God speaks, he uses a certain vocabulary, doesn't he? Uh, It's vibrant, it uses numbers, it's colourful, it uses images. Uh, None of the language God uses is new. Uh, There are beasts in Daniel. There are serpents in Genesis 3. But when we deal with these colours and these images and these numbers, we need to remember they're qualitative, not quantitative. And we get a big, vibrant, clarifying word. We're at point three on the outline. This cycle of seven is a little less clearer than the others. But there is a discernible pattern. You'll see it there on your outline. Seven signs or scenes. One of the things we've got to be aware now as we dig deeper into these same events, a time seems to get twisted and mangled. And so a number of events that are happening here cover the whole scope of time. And John looks and he sees a great sign there in verses 1 to 2 of chapter 12. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, cried out in labour and agony as she was about to give birth. 
This woman is about to give birth and she's in great agony. Does that sound like anything familiar from God's word? This woman is clearly identified with God's mob. See the number 12 there, the people of God? This woman represents the people of God and she's about to give birth. And as we scan around the birthing suite, we notice someone lurking in the corner. Verse 3, then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. On its head were seven crowns. Its tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven, hurled them down to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. That's horrific, isn't it? We're meant to be horrified. Now, this is not the image of a bank in New South Wales. This is a wild dragon. This is a bloodthirsty dragon. This is a dragon that affects the fabric of the world. And the dragon wants to eat the baby. The baby is born. And we need to take careful note. She gave birth to a son a male who is going to rule all nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. It's a boy. The boy has a job description. As you read that job description in verse 5, you're meant to remember a poem, Psalm 2, which was the coronation poem sung at every crowning of the king of God's people. The baby is protected by God and kept safe, and so is the woman. It's the shortest biography of Jesus you're ever going to read, isn't it? The dragon's not happy. In fact, the unhappiness of the dragon is an expression of what this dragon has always been doing. Look at verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought. And the dragon always loses. The dragon is removed from the presence of God. And finally, we see a name for the dragon, don't we? There in verse 9. That name's familiar. And we've met this dragon before, actually. Actually, we met this dragon way back at the start of the Bible, didn't we? In Genesis chapter 3, the dragon's power is revealed. He's the teller of great lies. And the dragon has been thrown down to earth. And finally, we see the great division, don't we? The great conflict that all of God's word summarises. The great reality that is going on between Jesus' first and second coming, the great division that has always been in the world and the whole universe, it's between God and his mob and the dragon and his mob. And that great division is expressed in a great conflict as the dragon and his mob attack God and his mob using their weapons of lies And you notice the outcome is already set. Did you notice that? Look there in verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives to the point of death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great fury, because he knows his time is short. There's a voice speaking. God has defeated the devil already before time began and in all time. Why? Look there in verse 10. It's because God is creator and judge. And when God exercises his power... His kingdom is established eternally. I wish told the means of the victory. Did you see that there in verse 11? How? By the blood of the lamb. Remember that little boy? By the word of their testimony. Here we come face to face with what we already know is true. How worthy is that lamb that walked into the presence of God? In his life, death and resurrection, Jesus has defeated sin Death and the devil. And as his mob proclaims that as a faithful witness in the world, what are they doing? They're reminding that headless snake that he's already lost. And then the voice proclaims the response. There is great joy in the eternal universe and woe at the moment on earth. Remember that eagle from last week that flew across saying, woe, woe, woe? 
Well, here's the deep explanation of the judgment of sin, the judgment of idolatry, what we've seen in the previous two cycles of seven. Uh, Why is all of this happening on earth? Because of this great deep division between God and the devil, between God and his mob and the devil and his mob, and the devil has been cast out and he prowls the earth and that is God's judgment. God's judgment on him and God's judgment on all those who believe in him. And as he prowls around, I'm in the third sign here, verses 13 to 17, as he prowls around, that dragon, that headless snake thrashes and he just wants to maim as many of God's mob as he can. Verse 13, when the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who'd given birth to the male child. Here are the death throes of the dragon. He's been beheaded. He's been defeated and all he does is thrash around. And that's God's judgment. And as he thrashes around, do you notice what God does for his mob there in verses 13 to 17? He protects them. It feels like a long time, but it's not as long as we think. And God protects his mob. God is always in control and uh, we're reminded of that as the devil lashes out again and again. In this next section about these beasts, we're reminded again and again that God is still in control. The devil pursues and persecutes God's mob and he calls forth two beasts. Now, this is pretty psychedelic, isn't it? It's really in your face, very vibrant. Uh, One beast comes from the sea, one from the earth. They're both grotesque, they're both gruesome, they're both violent, they're both focused on opposing God. They're both focused on replacing the lamb. They're both focused on defying God's work. And, And the beast that comes out of the sea is given authority. The implication is authority from God. God says, do your best. See how you go. And so he's got authority to speak, authority to wage war on God's mob, authority over every nation, tribe, people in the world, authority to ridicule God. And the whole world flocks to this beast who is the expression of that great opposition to God. The whole world flocks to the beast except one group. Did you see them there in verse 8 of chapter 13? All those who live on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slaughtered. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. If anyone is to be taken captive into captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, he'll be killed. This calls for endurance and faithfulness from the saints. God's mob will persist. Remember what we've learned in those previous two cycles of seven? God's marked them. They're my mob. (laughs) They have a mark, and that is the proclamation and practice of Jesus. They are all in. All in. Every part of them is in, and God will not let any of them be taken, even though they might be maimed. And the beast from the earth is partnered with a beast from the sea. This is the fifth one. The beast from the sea is about ruling and dominating, destroying. The beast from the earth is about persuading and claiming. And they work together to say, how good is life without God? How good is life opposed to God? And that beast from the earth marks its mob with a proclamation and practice of opposition to God and devotion to opposition to God. If God's mark is perfection, the beast's mark is opposition to perfection. And at this point, you want to just pause and just step back a little bit. Uh, It's worth making just a couple of quick observations Against all the backdrop of what's going on, there is a deep fundamental certainty that we must not forget. It's there in chapter 12, verses 10, 11, and 12. All of this thrashing, all of this violence, all of this maiming cannot undo one established fact. What's that? Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead. Jesus wins, always present tense. The slaughtered lamb has defeated the devil. And all we have here are the death throes of a headless snake. And so that adds depth to what we've already seen. 
This helps us to see what we've seen in the seven seals and the seven trumpets. There is a deep and fundamental division in the whole of the cosmos between God and his mob and the devil and his mob. God's judgment is to allow the devil to go at it as best he can, already knowing that he is beaten. And so the devil can only act a great parody. The devil's got aspiration. He wants to be God. Do you see how he tries to be God? God is three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so the devil tries to be the same, dragon, beast, and beast. The lamb is slaughtered, and so the beast from the sea is fatally wounded, and look, he recovers. The lamb has all authority in heaven and on earth in his worship. The beast has all authority in heaven and earth in his worship. God marks his mob, and the beast does the same. Do you see the aspirations of the beast? I want to be God, but I'm already headless. And as John looks around the world that he lives in, on that little rock in the Mediterranean, he goes, I'm living this. Domitian, that great emperor of Rome, who demands to be worshipped in life as God himself, who rules the world with a navy and an army that conquers everything, who's established his little shrines all over the known world so people can flock to him and worship him, who dominates all economy, who claims to be divine, And as you look across history, it's not just John in Patmos who looks out at that. Uh, It's us humans at every point look out at people who aspire to be God. Structures who say we're divine. People who say I'm in the instrument of God for your salvation. In fact, I am God. And it appeals to that part of every little human who wants to be God, doesn't it? And so collectively and individually, this happens time and time again. And what happens each time? God's mob are maimed, but they're never destroyed. Because John then looks, chapter 14, verse 1, and he sees something wonderful. Then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. Look, look, there's a hill. And on that hill are gathered every one of God's mob. No one is lost. And when they're gathered on that hill, they sing because they're safe. And God sings with them, so to speak. And they're clearly marked. Did you see there in chapter 14, 4 to 5? These are the ones. These are the ones. These are people wholly devoted to God and the Lamb. They do not turn good things into God things. They don't dabble. They don't waver. They don't waffle. They don't wander. These are people clearly redeemed. They proclaim and practice Jesus. These are disciples. The lamb goes here, where do they go? They go there. The lamb goes there, where do they go? They go there. These people proclaim truth, not lies. And the truth that God's mob trade in is then captured as these angels come out and proclaim the eternal good news. You see, Domitian was sending gospels out every day of the week, saying, look at how great I am, and God only has to send out one gospel. (laughs) It's eternal. And that gospel is very clear. God is in charge. The opponent of God is beaten. There are two mobs in the world, God's mob and not God's mob. That's the truth that God's mob trade in that God's mob obey and persevere in, that God's mob are all in on. And it will lead to a great and final judgment, a great and final judgment that's described in the last few verses. Jesus sits there with a sickle and he harvests. And we know these images, don't we? We know what a grain harvest looks like. It's the day of judgment. And the grain is brought in and the grapes are brought in and the grain is threshed and the grapes are trodden on and the wrath of God is laid bare. There's no doubt about the outcome. That was decided long, long ago. The devil has been defeated and the great division which led to the great conflict is now revealed eternally. There are those with God and there are those against God and those with God, are safe. 
That third cycle of seven is pretty confronting, isn't it? It's a sequence that God's mob often find distracting. There are a lot of rabbit holes in this paddock. But let me tell you, its place is very clear. It's there to give us clarity. And you'll see clarity there at the last point. There is clarity about God. God is in control. Uh, This is not a competition of equals. This is not a yin and a yang, a white and a black, a dark and a light. At, At no point is the outcome unclear or uncertain. At the cross, God has beaten sin, death, and the devil. Uh, But even that language of a competition is misleading because he wasn't even in with a chance. And in that authority, God is consistently fair, faithful, clear, and true. God does not trade in lies. God reveals truth. And there's your division. There's clarity about the world too, isn't there? These layers as we unfold them in these four cycles of seven reveal the deception the world has fallen for. You want to be God? How's that gone for you lately? You want to be devoted to something other than God? How has that gone for you lately? You want to believe the lies of the devil? How has that gone for us lately? Our world is fundamentally deceived by those lies, by the parody of God. It's expressed individually and corporately. And we are told to be realistic about this, but not fearful. To be thoughtful about this, not anxious. To know that there are a stack of lies, but do not give it more credit than it deserves. It's a stack of lies. And don't fall for it. There's clarity about humanity. There are only two groups, those with God and those against him those bathed in the blood of the lamb and those taking the blood of the lamb, those who follow truth and those who follow lies. And there are clear consequences and you are all in in one or the other. There is clarity about the world and there's clarity about God's mob. The description of God's people is so clear, isn't it? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, 12.17. The 144,000 who are gathered with God who have four descriptions, the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes, those who are all in on Jesus to the point of losing their lives. lives. Nothing should disturb or distract that faithful witness. The claims of political rulers, the lies of conspiracies, the lure of worshippers of good things, the distraction of the parody opposed to God, the threats of violence, don't be distracted. Don't be disturbed. And nothing should distract God's mob from proclaiming and practising Jesus. Nothing. Not winter sport or summer sport, not work opportunities or family events, no search for authenticity or once-in-a-lifetime experiences. No educational opportunity or distraction. No social status or community event. The lamb is followed where? Wherever he goes. And as God's mob do that, they are certain that they will stand on that hill and they will sing that song. And as they proclaim and practice, others will know God as he truly is. Let me pray. Father, it's a confronting passage. It's kind of very overwhelming. Uh, You're overwhelming. Uh, Overwhelming in your truth and grace and love and justice and mercy and kindness and power. And you've exercised all of this in the blood of the Lamb so that the outcome of the great conflict is sorted. Father, help us to know that truth and to love it. Help us to live that truth and proclaim it. And Father, through that, help us to be all in so that others may come to know and love Jesus as he is revealed in your word. We pray all this in his name. Amen.